Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Follett, and today I will be uh, conducting the webinar Metal Building Design in RESA 3D. Uh, before we go ahead and jump into really the meat of the presentation, I want to just review a few of the audio and uh, video options um, within the Zoom webinar setup. And so if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, you have a few audio options. So obviously, you could either use your phone or you could log in via the computer audio if you're uh, using a headset or a microphone with a computer. Additionally, um, my colleague Debbie Penko has uh, joined us for this meeting and she will be available in the Q&A section. So uh, you can click on the question and answer. You can type in your question there and then Debbie's going to be answering some questions as we go. And then depending on our time and depending on what the questions look like, we might have some time for some questions at the end as well. And so uh, with that, uh, if you do have any uh, Zoom, specific Zoom questions, go ahead and, and put them in there. If you're having any issues, put them in there and hopefully Debbie can help you out. But without that, with, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into kind of uh, the content for today, which is a discussion of pre-engineered metal buildings and, and really how they're designed in RESA 3D. And so I just pulled a few pictures of some pre-engineered metal buildings, including the model uh, that we're going to kind of build today from scratch in RESA 3D. Um, I particularly like this little image over here just because it talks a little bit about the different type of structural elements um, that we would consider in a structure like this. So, um, you know, our rigid frame, you know, kind of individually our rigid frames where maybe we have a tapered uh, column and a tapered beam. We have our end wall frames where maybe we have, um, you know, regular hot rolled shapes. We've got our girts and our roof purlins. Maybe those are uh, cold form steel. In our case, that's what they're going to be. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, a few of these different items as we go ahead and model our structure. Additionally, some other design considerations that we may need to investigate or we will investigate. Um, obviously, the tapered shapes, um, bracing, both horizontal and um, vertical bracing. Um, do we use something which we call in RISA analysis offsets? So basically, meaning do we have the purlins, those cold, cold form purlins, you know, run and sit on top of the, um, of the tapered shapes like they would in, in reality in construction, although that's maybe not the way that we analyze them, and we can go ahead and look at that. Um, obviously, we'll look at gravity and lateral loading in the system and then talk a little bit about member bracing and proper unbraced length and how that's really going to impact the design. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump into the um, uh, the software. So before I run into uh, Risa 3D, I do want to jump into Autodesk uh, and uh, into AutoCAD here. And so when I'm looking at AutoCAD, I'm, I'm going to use uh, an AutoCAD file that I created an elevation here to uh, start to build my model, to quickly and easily use this DXF to build my model. Um, and so in that particular case, um, I've got this information created for me in AutoCAD. You can see that I've got the external, um, kind of the extents of the element. And so I've actually modeled in kind of the shapes here. So we can see I've got some tapered columns and beams. I've got some end wall members as well. Um, so I'm basically putting this all in one so I could use this. And then I also have this green line, which is going to be our center line in this case. And so one thing that's specific to um, a tapered shape, obviously, is, is the location of that center line. So obviously, the center line, because we have a tapered section, we're not going to get this um, continuous um, you know, shape or cross section along the center line. And so we have to um, you know, kind of determine for ourselves how we want to um, put this center line in, in this tapered member. And so what I've chosen to do in this particular case is I've gone from the center of the kind of bottom size there to the center of the top here. And so that center line is actually a little bit sloped in this case. Um, so we have that and I can go ahead and use this and import this as my DXS F file to start my model. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump into Risa 3D. So we're using, in this case, sorry about that, we're using this case Risa 3D version 18, so the newest version of Risa 3D. So if you're not familiar with Risa 3D version 18, obviously uh, we've got a, a nice, uh, clean, new interface. Um, and there's a lot of videos on our YouTube channel that you can dive into on a variety of different subjects for Risa 3D version 18. Um, we'll talk about some of them today as we walk through um, this metal building project. But um, if you have more information or more questions, visit our YouTube channel, visit our, uh, our webpage. Um, all of that information is there. And so with that, I'm going to start in the Drawing Tools tab. And so where we have our rectangular and uh, circular radial grid, we also have an option to choose a DXF underlay. And so if I choose a DXF underlay, I can go ahead and actually import this DXF. And so I'm going to go ahead and choose the button to import a DXF grid. I'm going to navigate to the folder where I have my grid work saved. So I've just got this metal building design folder where I have this DXF saved. And I'm going to click Open. 
And so when I do that, we can just import all layers or I actually want to color the layers so I can see things a little bit better and I know exactly what I'm using. So I'm going to set my layers to be red. I'll set that green layer uh, or that centerline layer that we had in AutoCAD to be green as well. And then the structure layer to be red and I can click done. And so once I've imported that, we can now see that information imported um, in that, in that uh, XY kind of vertical uh, uh, grid space so or vertical uh, plane. And so now with this geometry, I can begin to use this to create um, my cross sections, create my model information. And so let's go ahead and start to do that. So I'm going to go back to my home tab here. And we could, um, and maybe what you would have done in the past uh, with a previous version of Risa would be to first create section sets kind of step by step. But now with the new version of Risa 3D, if I go into the members and I'm going to, my properties then is going to switch to what type of member I want to uh, add, I can actually add um, from the shape database or from a section set right from this interface. So let's first add the columns. And so I'm going to change my type to column. I don't want to use a specific shape. I'm actually going to choose to create a section set. And I'm going to hit this uh, three dot button, which is called the ellipsis. So I'll hit the ellipsis button here. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new section set. And so I'm going to call this section set frame column. And so that's going to be our frame column section set. And then I need to set a shape here. So if I go into the shape database, I've got all my different shapes for the AISC, but I'm going to choose a tapered wide flange. Now I do have some already created. So let's go ahead and look at these shapes. And so I could either add one or hit edit. And so if I hit edit here, we can see this shape. And so I can give it a shape name. So a tapered wide flange column. And then I have all of the dimensions here that I need to implement in this picture. And so we can see at the tapered wide flange start and the tapered wide flange end, I can see the different uh, sizes that I want to use. So in this case, I'm going to do a 20 inch flange here, or excuse me, 20 inch depth at the bottom with a 12 inch flange at the, at the bottom and at the top, and then a, a half inch uh, web and flange thickness. And then at the opposite end, so the longer or the, the thicker end or the deeper end, I'm going to have a 32 inch thick, uh, de depth with 12 inch wide flanges and then a half inch thick all the way through. Now, I could also calculate my properties. So this is going to calculate all the properties that are going to be used in the calculation. So I can click calc or recalc here to calculate those properties and get those updated section properties. And when I'm ready, I can go ahead and click OK. I'm not going to choose to update that. That's fine. Now I have the same thing for the beam here. So if I edit real quick the beam here, I can see, again, the same exact thing. And in this case, the same kind of property layout. So the only thing different about the beam here, we've chosen to use the same uh, width of flange, both at the top and the bottom, 12 inches, and the same thickness of web and flange. So a half inch web and a half inch flange thickness. But in the depth here, I've chosen the starting depth. So the smaller depth at the ridge is going to be 24 inches. And the larger step at the eave here is going to be 40 inches. And so that's going to be my beam section that I'm going to use. So I'll go ahead and click OK. Now, when I have these sections created, in this case, remember, we started with the column. I'm going to select that and click OK. And so now I've got that shape. I'm going to, again, choose my member type. It's a column. Uh, we'll choose our design list. Just say the wide flange. We'll set our material. So our material is going to be this A992. So that's fine. And then we'll keep our design rule the same. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And now we can see that section set is what has chosen. And so I can actually go ahead to model in this location at this frame end. And so if I choose my snap points, and now I have snap points based on my DXF here, I can go ahead and say, start to, now I want to go up to my, my center line here. Remember, I don't want to go all the way up to the top here. So I want to go to my center line node and click there. And then I can right click to exit that command and start a new column over here again, going to that center line. And so now that I have my columns, I could go ahead and switch to add in my beams. And so again, if I go ahead, I, in this case, I want to add another new section set. So create new section set. We'll call this frame beam. Again, we'll choose our shape here. So I'll choose my tapered wide flange shape. And we'll choose our tapered wide flange beam shape that we have. So I'll click OK. Well, member type here is going to be beam this time. Same design list. So choose the wide flange, same material, same design rule. And click OK. Now remember, the start that I defined was the 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 not the less deep portion, right? The shallower portion of our member. So in that case, I'm going to model in from the ridge out to the eave. So if I model this and come down to our node point here, we get our first element. And then maybe I want to turn off, just for our model's sake, I want to turn off our rendering here so I can actually see where I'm going. I can model then to this node as well. And so once that's created, I can go ahead and turn our rendering back on. 
and we've got kind of our basic frame that we've added here, right? So our basic frame we've got um, that we're going to use kind of, this is our rigid frame. Like we were talking about in uh, our, our PowerPoint, we've got our rigid frame sections. Now, in this particular case, uh, I'm going to go ahead and also add in uh, these HSS columns. So these are going to be my end wall columns. And so that's what I'm starting with. I'm starting by creating an end wall kind of uh, elevation in this case. And so if I go back into members, again, I want to go ahead and create another section set for my end wall columns. And so again, I'm going to come into section set, say create a new section set. We'll call this one end wall column. We'll choose a new shape. In this case, it's going to be a tube. Not a pipe here, sorry, a tube. And then I'm going to come down and choose an A1085 tube. So let's choose a 10 by 10 by, I don't know, 5 A1085. So if you're not familiar with A1085, that is the uh, the standard material, or that is a, a new standard for uh, material for HSS shapes, which gives you a higher yield uh, stress for the particular material and a tighter tolerance in manufacturing. So I'll go ahead and click OK. This is going to be a column. We'll choose our square tube A1085 as our design list. And then I'm going to go ahead and choose that A1085 material and click OK. And again, I can go ahead and get rid of our rendering here, and I can start to model in from node to the center line of the beam. From node to center line of the beam here. Oops. Node to center line of the beam here. Let's go the same way one last time. Okay, so now we have kind of our end frame here. So if we turn on the rendering, we've got that end frame there modeled really quickly, really easily modeled based on that geometry that we had. And so now if we have um, now if we have uh, this elements, you know, we need to start to create multiple frames here. So we're going to go ahead and now use some copy features within Risa 3D to go ahead and copy these multiple frames because we don't want to have to draw these frames by scratch each and every time that we do this. And so if we go ahead and I'm going to get an ISO view just so I can see everything a little bit better. I'm going to go ahead and select the frame columns and the frame beams because I first want to create those interior frames that don't actually have this end wall column. So I'm going to select the frame column and frame beam just by using kind of the highlight. This is very familiar for those that are in AutoCAD or in Revit. You know, you get the, the dashed box allows you to highlight everything that touches it, whereas the solid box would highlight only things that are completely in it. I'm also going to do the same thing over here by clicking Control so I can add those to the selection. And when adding those to the selection, one thing to notice if you're not familiar with Risa 3D version 18, is you can see in the properties here, you can see everything that's been selected. So I can choose, hey, my hot rolled steel members, my nodes, all, you know, I could choose different things to make changes to different groups of information at the same time or at different times. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead in my modify and choose to do a global copy. Now, when I choose to do a global copy, I can choose to set up the increment in which I want to copy. So basically the direction in which I want to copy it. And so in this case, I'm going to choose the Z direction here. And in this case, you can see based on the little uh, navigation icon here, it would be the positive Z direction. And so the Z increment here, I'm going to set, I want five frames at, oops, at 15 feet a piece. And so if I do that and I click apply to selected, that will apply it to those selected frames. And now I get that geometry created for me. And so now I'm going to do one more copy, and that's going to be kind of the end of our frame. So I'm going to this time use the uh, shift key or the, excuse me, the control key again to select this entire frame because I want the end wall columns because I need to create the opposite end wall frame, right? And instead of a, a spacing at a certain dimension, I'm going to go ahead and just say, I want a Z increment to be 90 feet, and that's going to be another 15 feet beyond the last one I did, and select apply to select it. And so now we've kind of created very quickly all of our frames there. Now, the last thing that we have to do before we can kind of press on with some of these other things is, and we talked about this in the PowerPoint, is that we might want to change our frame, uh, frame beams or frame columns, being that we don't, you know, maybe we don't want to use the tapered shape at those end wall se sections. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and select the end wall beams here. And so I'm just going to use the selection just like I did before. So I've selected those four elements and I'm going to bulk make a change to those elements. But by doing that, I need to go ahead and create a new section set. So again, I'm going to go ahead and click the ellipsis and create a new section set. And we're going to go ahead and call this end wall beam. And I'm going to choose a new shape for that. So let's choose a wide flange and let's make it something like a 14 by, I don't know, 68 will work in this case. 
It's a beam. It's a designless wide flange, A982 material. So that's all fine and good. And then we can go ahead and just click OK. And so now we've created that final section set in those end wall in that end wall uh, elevation. Now, if we hadn't drawn the end wall columns to start and needed to draw them later on, maybe maybe we forgot to draw them up here, and we now needed to draw them at this location down here. We can always move the origin of our DXF. So if I go ahead and turn off the rendering here, so we can see a little bit better again. If I go to the drawing tools, I can change the origin of that DXF that I imported. And so I can come down here and say, actually, I need that DXF to be at the Z equals 90 foot dimension, and we can just drop it or move it right to that location. And so then if I needed to, oh, now I will need to draw these verticals here, I could go ahead and do that rather than using the copy, rather than using some of the other things there. So you can move that DXF around as you need it. You could rotate it, you could change the scale factor, change the units, you could do a lot of different things. You could even just click to locate if you didn't know the, the exact dimension of that. So you could do a lot of different things um, uh, in a flexible nature with that DXF file. And it's really meant to help you create the geometry um, from the start. Okay, so we've got the main kind of geometry here uh, of our, or main kind of hot roll geometry here from our, of our system. And so now we need to start to add our um, purlins and our girts. So basically all that secondary uh, framing information. So if I check, if I, I'm on an isometric view here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just select these two frames because I want to just start by working on these two frames to create my purlins. And then I want to be able to do, I want to be able to copy or, uh, you know, uh, multiply what I've done on these two frames to the rest of the structure. So I'm just going to use uh, the lock feature to kind of close out or lock out the rest of the model from a view standpoint. And so I'm actually going to use the dim lock feature. I love the dim lock feature because it allows me to still see and reference what the rest of the model looks like, but doesn't allow me to select anything and doesn't kind of show anything else. And so with that selected, I can go ahead and start to create purlins. And so the first thing I need to do, though, is I want to put purlins on the roof here, and I want them to put them at a specific spacing. And so to do that, I think the easiest thing to do is to use a feature called add nodes. And so I'm going to be able in the modify here, I'm going to add nodes. So I'm not going to split members, but I'm just going to add node points, basically points that I can go ahead and um, add connections to um, at the very, at the, or finite element connections to um, at those nodes. And so I'm going to go ahead and select our beams here. So again, just using control to select multiples at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and click add nodes. And then it's going to give me some options for add nodes. So we can choose a uniform spacing. We could set a specific percentage. You could set a specific location to add that node. In this case, I'm going to choose that uniform spacing. And then I'm going to say, hey, I want 10 uniform segments along each of these members. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that for uh, these elements. And so if I click apply to selected, now I get those nodes added along those members. And so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off our rendering because it'll just be easier to see in this case. And then let's go ahead. I'm also gonna just turn off our DXF underlay for just a second. So let's just turn off the display grid. Okay, so now I have, I have those nodes there added. I can begin to draw with my section set for a cold form member, my purlins. And so to do that again, I'm gonna in this case, I'm not going to use hot rolled steel anymore. I'm going to change to cold form. And again, I need to create a new section set. So I'm going to create a section set, create a new section set. And let's call this, I don't know, Perlin. You know, pretty simple, straightforward. And then I'm going to choose my shape. So we have a variety of shape databases. So we have the AISI, AISI database, also the SSMA database. I'm going to use this AISI database. And I'm going to choose the Z section. So the ZS section, which basically is defined by Obviously, the shape, it looks like a, a Z or a reverse Z in this case, but also has this little, these little tails on it, these little flanges on it at the end. And so the first one I'm going to choose here is a 10. So let's choose a 10, uh, 275, 70 here. That's the first one we're going to choose. Actually, let's choose an 85. Maybe that'll be a little bit better for what we're going to do. Now, I could look at the section if I wanted to. I could view the properties of this section. We could see exactly how this section is being calculated if we wanted to. In this case, I don't need to make any changes to that, so I'm just going to choose the section. Additionally, I can go ahead and change the member type. It's going to be a beam. I could set up a design list. So if I wanted to set up a design list for this shape, I could go ahead and add a new design list. So let's say I want to create a ZS design list. And then from that, I can go ahead and say, I want to create a design list um, based on this particular shape. And maybe the best way to do it in this case would be to uh, modify the design list in our advanced tab. And we'll do that right after we add this. Now, the last thing I want to do is set up a material. So I'm going to choose a 50 grade 
uh, steel, uh, a coform steel in this case, and we'll keep the design rule the same. Now I'll click OK. And now I'm in my modeling. And so I can begin to model just by drawing point to point. So if I just draw point to point, remember, I'm clicking uh, the right click on the mouse button in between drawing because I don't want to basically start at the end node of my member. I'm going to zoom in here to make sure I get the right node here as well. And so I'm just going to draw in the purlins on this side of the structure. Now, once I reach kind of the roof here, or excuse me, the roof ridge, I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, just for fun, show another way that we could get the rest of the purlins in here. And so once I've drawn those, um, you know, I could have also copied purlins in uh, using our copy point to point. So I could have drawn one and then just selected to copy from point to point. That would have been another option. The other option here is I can go ahead and select these purlins. And I actually want the purlins to the other side of the roof. So I'm going to go ahead and use the mirror function. And so if I want to mirror, I'm going to actually mirror around this node, right? So like we can see, okay, what node is that? So that's node N45. So if I went to look at my node coordinates here, I could find N45 and say, okay, N45, here's my dimensions for N45. And so for N45, the dimension I want to uh, mirror around is going to be this X dimension. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that X dimension just so I have it. And then if I have these selected in my modify, I can choose to mirror. And I can choose the plane in which I want to mirror. So the plane I want to mirror here is this YZ plane. So I'm going to select that YZ plane. So YZ. I can select that X location then, remember? So this X location in this direction, I copied that location. So that's there. And then I can click apply to select it. And so when I do that, we just get that selected down there. We can actually now escape out of the command. I can select to make sure. It created two nodes, but they're at the same location. And the way I know that is by, if I go to the Modify tab, I can use what we call Model Merge. And this is just going to find all these duplicate nodes, and it's going to remove those duplicate nodes, which are in the same location just because I mirrored that, and I already had those nodes created for me. So now here I can see I only got one node, and I've got it the location that I want. And so now I have these purlins in here. I could go ahead and unlock the model. And again, I'm going to go ahead and select... Uh, the purlin. So in a variety of different, I can go ahead and just, oops, I can go ahead and just grab these purlins here. So just grab them. And then I want to do that same kind of multi-copy just in the opposite direction, right? And so in this case, I'm going to choose the global copy again, and I'm going to choose the Z increment in this case to be five at, now I'm going in the opposite direction. So I need to go in the negative direction, the negative Z direction. So negative 15. So I click apply to selected. And now we've got the rest of our roof purlins in here. Now, generally, um, when we're looking at Perlin design, there's a few different things that we can consider. So the first thing is, let's talk about how the Perlins need to be connected to the other Perlins. So in a lot of cases, when you look at metal building design, you've got this kind of overlap right here where two Perlins meet. So maybe you've got lapped Perlins, and at that case, you've basically got a fixed condition. Maybe you've even got some case where you're going to look at the, uh, the section over top of that beam that's actually a doubled section, really, where that overlap is. And so from that perspective, you know, we can choose how we want to brace these. So in this case, if I select a member here, we can see in our I and J releases. So if I open up the ellipsis here, right now, these releases are fully fixed. So I haven't added any pins or any removal of uh, boundary conditions at the end of these members. And so we're going to leave those elements as fixed fixed. The ones I do want to, however, add a boundary condition to is the uh, end members. And so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of grab a selection here of those end members. And I want to go ahead and choose to add a release. And so because I drew them from kind of first node to second node, I node to J node, I can go ahead and add an I release. I could also, if I wanted to, I could go into my, uh, my, some of my uh, quick view buttons here and I could go ahead and look at um, our, uh, let's see, we can look at our uh, segments or our I and J, our, our, we could see our I and J ends. Um, oops, sorry, it's down here. We can see our I and J ends here. So I can see, okay, my I end is red and my J end is green here. So we can see exactly what we need to add in this particular case. So for these members, if I go ahead and select them and I go to the I release, I'm going to add a pin on the I side there. And so we can see that pin now in the end there. And so I'm going to do the same thing on the back of the frame here. So I'm going to just add those and say it on the J release, right? So add a pin on the J release there. And so now let's go ahead and go back to just kind of our uh, regular uh, frame here. 
we can see that we've got a fixed condition, kind of where we would have those lapped purlins, and then a pin condition at the end here. Now, the other thing that um, is a possibility here is we need to look at the rotation of those purlins, right? So if I go ahead and turn on a graphical view, and then let's go ahead and look at the, whoops, wrong one, the vertical view here. We can see here that those purlins are kind of in the global direction, right? So they're in the, you know, their, their uh, web lines up with the global Y direction. This is a little tough to see. We could go ahead to our view and our model settings, and I can go ahead and change the transparency of these members so that we can see a little bit better here. So maybe that's a little bit better. So we can see here that the rotation maybe isn't quite what we want in this particular case. Now, if we want to change the rotation to follow the slope of the roof, right? We just have to calculate um, the purlins, uh, the, the slope such that the purlins are rotated so that the uh, web is perpendicular to our beams here, right? And perpendicular to the slope of the roof. So in this case, you know, using a little geometry, everything that we learned in uh, maybe high school geometry, right? We're just going to do the inverse cosine of the uh, adjacent dimension. So the X dimension here. So this is 49 foot eight. Uh, divided by the dimension, the kind of hot hypotenuse dimension in this case, which is 50 feet, that's going to give us a rotation of 6.62 uh, degrees. And so in this particular case, if we want to go ahead and add that, we can. So I can go ahead and select the purlin. So I'm going to go ahead and to do this really quickly, I'm going to turn off everything else and just do some quick selections. So I'm going to do a select elements by property or criteria. And so I can pick then my uh, section set and pick my purlins and say, I want to select all those purlins. So that gives me all the purlins selected at one time. And then I'm going to go ahead and lock those shapes. Let's do a, let's do a lock like that. And then I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, well, I want to first select these purlins, right? Because those are the purlins that need to get a specific rotation. And so if I go into my additional properties here, I can choose the rotation. Now, when I'm looking at this rotation, um, I could go ahead and put in that 6.62, but we'll see that actually rotates it in the opposite direction. So, right, because the positive starting starting vertical positive direction, like a clock here. So what I really need to do is rotate it 360 minus that 6.62. So 353.38 should give us that rotation, which it does, which is perfect. And now I'll do the same thing on this side. So just rotate around here and grab those purlins and give us a rotation of that 6.62. Now, it probably makes sense now that we're thinking about it, if I look at the end purlins here, so if I look at these end purlins and these end purlins, probably no rotation needed here because it's right at the eave there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete the rotation there, just like I didn't put a rotation at the mid span, at the, at the ridge purlin as well. So if we go ahead and look at this now, no rotation, we've got our rotation such that they follow the roof, no rotation at the ridge, and then again, back down here. So we've now got our rotations set um, as we would expect it. So I'm gonna go ahead and unlock everything. Now, one of the last things here to note though is how the connectivity of this is currently working. And so we have our, we have our Perlin and our Perlin now is connected to the center line of any of those individual beam members, right? So when we're transferring loads, when we're, tr when we're looking at results here, we can see, um, you know, we can see a result, uh, we can see that we're going to transfer forces at the center line here, right? And that's, you know, the basics of kind of a center line based model in this particular case, right? And so when we're looking at this, we do have some options in order to change the way that this is kind of offset, if you will. So if I turn back on my rendering, if I go ahead and, and select maybe just a few purlins here, just to kind of show this, I can go ahead and change my analysis offsets here. So if I open the ellipsis here, we can see that we can move the center line, basically move the analysis line away from the center line of the given member. And so this graphic gives you kind of a really easy way to do that. So I can go ahead and say, okay, well, I actually want the analysis line at the bottom of the Perlin in this case. So that makes sense. So I can switch that. So that now gives me the node for the center line at the bottom of the Perlin. I could also do the same thing with the beam, right? So maybe we'll select this beam and that beam. And I can say, from an additional properties perspective, I want the analysis line for these members to be at the top of the beam, right? And so if I switch that, then, you know, we'll have this situation where we have now the purlin resting on the beam. Now, that may be the most accurate thing to do, right? That's the way that in construction that's going to be built. But from an analysis, from an analysis standpoint, it may not be prudent. It may not be um, the most useful thing to do. You're also going to get maybe results that 
um, from a metal building perspective, you're not maybe used to, right? Because you're going to get axial force from gravity load in these because of the, dip, the eccentricity between the center line of the beam and the actual analysis line. So there's just a lot of things that you have to consider when using analysis offsets. We have a lot of really great articles and some videos about analysis offsets. And so really, it's just an engineering judgment choice that needs to be made for your particular model, whether it's a metal building or whether it's not a metal building. And so in this particular case, I'm just going to go ahead and go back to um, go back to the setup that I had. So I'm going to keep a centerline-based setup um, just for the sake of this particular uh, model. Okay, so the next thing we can do is we've got our purlins, we've got our roof beams, we've got our end columns. The last thing we need is some horizontal girts. And so girts are drawn around the exterior of the structure in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and use our select elements by property again. And instead of the purlin, I'm going to select my columns. So let's select first the frame columns and then just really quickly again, select the end wall columns. So that'll give me all the columns. And I can go ahead and then turn off the uh, turn off everything else. So I've got my columns then. And next, I'm going to go ahead and add some nodes because I want the girts to be at a continuous elevation around the exterior of the structure. So I'm going to add some nodes just like I did before. So let's add a node at specific locations this time. So the first one, let's put it at five feet. So apply to selected. And then let's put it at maybe nine feet or something like that. Apply to selected. So now we've got those at different locations, right? And so with that, we can go ahead and start to model in our girts. And so I'm going to go ahead again to the members here. I'm choosing cold form. And then I'm going to select to add another new section set. In this case, let's call it girt. And again, let's go to the ZS shape and let's call it an eight. So let's call it an eight by 27570. So let's do that. That's fine. And then we can go ahead and set our design list. We can set our material. So all that is fine and good. So we can create this information. And then uh, let's also set our member type. Let's actually set our member type in this case to our horizontal brace. And so again, I can go ahead and add a new uh, design list because I changed my member type. So I can create a new design list for our ZS shape. Let's call this ZS GERT actually, so that we don't overwrite the current uh, design list. So that's fine. So shape type ZS. And let's go back to our ASA. So now we've got that the way we want it. And so we've got that information, click OK. And now I'm ready to model with my GERT section set. And so I also want to automatically, so as I'm modeling, I want to apply pins to all, to all the ends. So these are going to be pin members around the length uh, or around the perimeter of the model here. And then I can go ahead and start to add the members. So I'm just going to go ahead and model real quick as we click around the structure here. Again, we're grabbing the nodes. Now, one of the things here is if we can see that there's other nodes that are kind of popping up here. So in this case, I have these other snap settings. So if I have other snap settings, I could go ahead and turn those snap settings off. So in this case, and by default, we have snap settings for quarter points. We have snap settings for third points. You could even turn on snap settings for various increments. So there's some value in having like a snap setting at every one foot, or maybe you're modeling something where you need a snap setting every five feet. You, know, you can go ahead and turn those settings on and off uh, based on how you uh, want to create the model. Additionally, you can also turn on some universal snap settings. So those are the options um, to the far right of the drawing tools. And those universal snap settings do the same sort of uh, kind of thing that the general snap settings do, but they give you snaps universally on the entirety of the project. So it doesn't need to be actually on a member. It's actually just anywhere in the model space um, that you want to create kind of a, a, a snap setting. So I could go ahead and turn these universal snap points on, and then I would get these kind of points every kind of foot or every two feet, whatever we set it in a certain plane location. So we can go ahead and set that up as we want. Okay, so now we have uh, those horizontal members in. The last thing we need to do to them is we need to rotate them. So again, I'll just do a quick select elements by property and we want to select our girts. So that gives me uh, the flexibility to select them all at the same time. Select elements by property really is one of my favorite um, uh, tools, you know, kind of the most useful tools to be able to select everything of a certain property or kind of in a certain group at one time or multiple times, you know. So it really gives me a lot of flexibility when I'm trying to select and make changes bulk to uh, things. Now, 
this would have been a lot, you know, this is what I think is one of the great improvements in Risa 3D version 18 is just selecting things and then being able to come into the properties and say, oh, okay, I've got, in this case, 44 members selected. I want to make a change to all 44 members at the same time. In this case, I'm going to change the rotation to 90 degrees and just change that, right? No more having to go into double click dialogues or go to the modify design or modify um, at member and then rotate and apply to all. You can just do this much more efficiently in my mind. Okay. So we've got the bulk of the geometry, John. Um, the next thing is, you know, we don't have any uh, boundary conditions. So I'm going to go ahead and just select all the nodes at the bottom there. And back on the home tab, let's go ahead and add a boundary condition. I'm just going to pick a fixed boundary condition in this case and apply to all the selected nodes there. So that gives me the nodes there. The last thing I want to do too is let's go ahead and on this side, I'm actually going to delete those. Maybe I want a door. Right, so maybe this is the doorway, the entrance into that metal building. We can go ahead and create that um, just by deleting those elements. The next thing I want to do is we've got our kind of main main structure in. We've got our secondary framing in. The last thing that probably makes sense to add here is our bracing. So both horizontal and vertical bracing in the frames. And so to do this, I'm going to add some cable cross bracing. So when modeling cables for the purpose of lateral load resistance, um, it's important to create a specific material type that will be applied to the cable members. And so the main reason for this is due to our desire to remove maybe the, the weight of the cable when maybe we want to look at this cable as a tension only element. And so let's go ahead and do just that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, first I want to select, I'm just going to select uh, a single frame here or kind of a kind of a bay here. And let's go ahead and turn everything else off. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a new member. So this member is going to be a hot rolled member. Let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and delete these pins out of it. I want a new section set. So that's fine. I'm going to edit this section set. So edit the last one I had here. And I'm going to call this, uh, let's call this cable, right? So let's call this cable. I'm going to come into my shape and I'm going to make this a solid round bar. And so I have a few options that are already in my model here. And so I'm going to just choose this three quarter inch diameter bar. If you wanted to add another one, you could just choose add and then just create the shape name, create the, the diameter and then calculate the properties. But in this case, I'm going to use this three, uh, three quarter inch diameter bar. Click OK. I want this member type to be a vertical brace. So let's make this a vertical brace. Um, it's going to be designed from the bar... Uh, design list. The material here, this is where I need to create something new. So I'm going to go ahead to add a material then in this case. And so I want to call this a cable material. And so the properties of the material are going to be the same, but in this case, I want to remove this density. So basically removing the weight of this particular element, right? And so I can go ahead and do that. And now I have that material cable that's going to be assigned to this section set. And then I can keep my design rule. Okay, um, I actually do want to add some pins here. So let's just put pins back on our members here. And then I can also go ahead and look at some of the additional properties as far as tension and compression only members. And so there's four options when looking at a tension and compression only. So you have kind of the base option, which we call both ways. Really, that's a member that takes both tension and compression loads. So nothing different than a regular kind of standard member. Then we have what's called tension only. Obviously, that member takes only tension loads. Compression only takes only compression loads. And then the final option is what we call Euler buckling. Basically, a member will primarily take only tension loads. However, it will also take some compression loading up to its Euler buckling load. And so for this particular case, when I'm modeling these, I'm going to make these all tension only. And so the first thing I'm going to do now that I have all kind of the settings set up and I'm drawing node to node, and I'm just going to go from start to end here and draw those nodes there. Now, the next thing I can do is I can start to draw my bracing on my roof. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a four bay kind of per, uh, spacing here, and then three bays or three purlins, and then three purlins to the eave, so now, or to the ridge, excuse me, now I'm sitting in the, at the ridge, and then I'm gonna go in the opposite direction. So three, three, and down to four. And then I can go ahead and draw in our spacing this way and then just kind of go in the opposite direction here, right? So go four, three, up to the ridge, down, down, and then down again, right? So very quickly, I've got those, those braced members, right? 
And so now with those bracings added, I can go ahead and create a second set of those. So I'm going to get unlock all this again, one last time, use my favorite tool, that selection tool, choose cable, choose select. So I've got those selected and then I'm just going to use a global copy and let's copy it uh, negative 30 feet. So I'm going to copy it down to this bay here and just hit apply selected. So now I've got that in that other bay down there. And so that gives us our second set of bracing. Now at this point, we've essentially finished our modeling. So we've got all the model information created the way that we wanted to. We can go ahead and proceed to adding in our loads. And so for this particular case, we're going to go ahead and create um, dead lo or excuse me, gravity loads and lateral loads. And so the first thing I need to do is just create some basic load cases. And so I'm going to just create you know, a simple dead basic load case. I'm going to create a live roof basic load case. And then I'll create a wind in the X and a wind in the Z case. And then create the categories that are assigned with these. So dead load, let's create a roof live load. And then I'm going to come down and grab these WLX and W. LZ. So let's grab those. And then the last thing I need to do in basic load cases before I start to add them is I need to go ahead and put assign some gravity loads. So gravity is going to be in the dead in the uh, negative. Uh, so in the Y direction in the negative Y direction. So I'm applying a negative one factor in that Y gravity cell there. Okay, before I go ahead and do anything else, right, I've built a pretty large model. I'm going to do two last things. I'm going to go ahead and run the model merge really quickly. So just to kind of see if there's anything that's found, um, create some nodes at crossing members so that I get kind of accurate connection of everything. So I've done that, which is great. And then the last thing I'm going to do is create a really quick combination. And I'm just going to call it self-weight. So right now, all I have is self-weight of the structure. If I could type, we would get there. And then I'm going to go ahead and add a simple dead load BLC and a simple factor of one. And then I'm just going to solve the current combination. So I just want to basically check this is, I'm going to use this as my sanity check. I just want to see if maybe I've missed something in modeling. Maybe I've created some issues for myself. And in this case, it's, it tells me that I have an instability. And so it's saying, hey, you've got an instability. Would you like to look at the locked node view? And so in this case, if I go ahead and turn on off my rendering here and turn on my nodes. So we have some in the middle here at my crosses. So in that particular case, you know, maybe creating those nodes at those crossing locations wasn't the best thing to do. So maybe I'm going to go ahead and back out of those node creation. So I'm going to go ahead and let's just uh, escape or excuse me, control Z out of those to create, to get rid of those nodes. So, or I could go ahead and just grab these, oops, grab these nodes here. So let's get a top down view and let's go ahead and grab the nodes inside this bay here that I created. So maybe we don't want those because it's creating some issues within our structure. So let's go ahead and grab those and grab those and let's just delete those nodes. So now we've done that. I can go ahead and rerun the model here. So let's just re-solve that uh, self-weight model. Let's see, make sure we have a load combination set up. So self-weight, BLC, one factor one and solve this combination here. So now we didn't get any issues. It was just those nodes that were causing the issue. But now I always like to look at my deflection just to make sure that kind of nothing is kind of screaming at me as far as something that's deflecting, you know, an insane amount. So we don't look like we have any really bad deflections here. We don't have anything falling off the page here. Obviously, I've got a magnification of my deflection of, of 40 on here. So some of the deflections may look a little big, but they're really not. We could look at no deflections. So at this point, you know, for all intents and purposes, we're ready to move forward. And so now I can go ahead and I've added the basic load cases. I can go ahead and add some loads. And so under the home tab, I have my loading options here. So I'm going to turn off my, uh, my deflection here and I'm going to start to add in some loads. So the first I'm going to add is our dead load. So I'm going to use an area load. Yeah, I know I'm going to lose results, so that's okay. But I'm going to do a dead load here. So in the Y direction, I'm going to choose the directionality in which this load is going to be applied. So I'm going to choose AB. And this is really, these, these let, this lettering, if you're not familiar, is really just how I draw. So the first node that I click when I'm drawing an area load is going to be the A node, then the B node, C node, D node, and so on. And so I can choose how the direction is associated with those nodes applied. And so I'm going to choose AB in this case, and let's choose a magnitude. 
let's make it um, 10 pounds a square foot. And so now if I go ahead and draw something, I can go ahead and pick my load that I want to draw in here and just click on the nodes here, right? And so I've got that first one there. And then I can go ahead and do the same thing, drawing in my second load on the opposite side of the roof here, right? So I've got my load applied in these, this direction, which is going to apply it to the purlins, which is exactly what I want. So I've got that. Now, after the load applied, I can always go ahead and look at the load in the basic loads uh, cases spreadsheet. So I can always see this back in the load cases spreadsheet. I can always click on this to open another load case and then really quickly change something if I wanted to. Or probably the easier way to do that now, if I wanted to physically make a change, I could actually go ahead and select the load. Now, if I wanted to add another load, I'm going to go ahead. In this case, I've got my dead load in. Now I want to look at my live roof load. So as soon as I switch my BLC, my view also changes. And again, I'm going to go ahead and add a magnitude. In this case, let's add 25 pounds a square foot. And so again, I'm going to go ahead and model to my ridge here. So here's my ridge and then down to my eave. So that's my first load. And then again, my second load here up to my ridge down to my eave, that gives me that second load there. So 25 pounds a square foot of roof live load in this particular case. Now we wanna add in our wind loading. So again, I'm gonna, you could use point loads or line loads, but in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and use an area load again, and I'm gonna apply the area load on the structure. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and choose that we want a directional load in the X direction in this case, right? So I'm gonna have a wind blowing in the X direction. I've got my BLC, so WLX, I've got my, Direction again uh, for my load application. So I'm going to apply it to the columns in this particular case. And then I can go ahead and apply uh, my load. And so again, I'm just going to go ahead and draw my load on this side of the roof here. Now my direction's right. So that's great. But you know what? Maybe I wanted to actually change my value here. So I didn't, I didn't mean to you know, keep it at 25 pounds per square foot. The greatest thing about Risa 3D now is I can actually select that load and I can just quickly come in here and change it to say, actually, I want this to be. 20 pounds a square foot on the on the wall there. So just quickly change that. And that's great. Now that's my windward pressure. So let's go ahead and add in my leeward pressure. So let's go ahead uh, back to my home tab here. Let's do an area load, same X, uh, same direction, same BLC. And let's go ahead and add that as our 10 pounds a square foot on the leeward side of the wall here. So I can go ahead and add that as well. Okay, so we've got our leeward pressure and our windward pressure for that direction. Now, the last thing I want to do is I need to add that uh, same type of load, so an area load on our kind of sloped side, so our end frames here. So that direction now is going to be Z, change this to WLZ. And I'm going to go ahead and set the direction here. The load is going to be the same here. So in this case, so let's do a 0.020 and start to model in then our load here. So first, um, to the eave there, so we have that. And then I'm actually just gonna put in, just for kind of complete list sake, just put in our load here, our triangular load at the top, so we get the load kind of everywhere that we want. And then I can go ahead and do the same thing on this side. So I'm gonna put it on this side where we have our, maybe our garage door. Um, so I can put that load in and then go ahead and put our final load in. Now again, I have didn't change the load uh, magnitude here. I can go ahead and I can select those two loads. So I've got two area loads. I can go ahead and change those really quickly to 10 pounds a square foot. So really quickly and easily, I can graphically change any load that I want um, so that I can, you know, I can continually uh, update this or make this to make it without having to go back into spreadsheets or, or other things. So the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create some load combinations. So we had our self-weight one created, but I'm going to go ahead and use the generator. And I'm going to create our first, our gravity combination. So I'm just going to use um, IBC ASD, and I'm going to keep my roof load combinations on. We'll generate those. And then I'll switch to wind here, and I'll choose IBC ASD again, and we'll choose X and Z combinations, and click generate again. And so we've got all of our load combinations generated now. So all 16 of our combinations here, we can see that. Now, before I go ahead and run the analysis, the last thing I want to do is I'm going to turn on my rendering again. And I'm going to turn off my nodes. And I'm just going to go ahead and take a snapshot of this model. So just like we saw there, I'm going to take up in the top corner here, say, save my model view as an image, say, OK. And then I can go ahead and kind of zoom in to get kind of the view I want. So that's maybe the view that I want. I don't have any text or anything on, but I can go ahead and say this is called ISO view. And then we're going to be able to actually see this view 
in our report when we get to that point where we're going to look at our report here. So I've got that view. I'm just going to say, take a snapshot. And that snapshot is going to be saved in, the, in a folder in the same location as our file is saved. And so now that I'm ready, I can go ahead, let's flip our nodes back on here. And I'm just going to go ahead and do a batch solution with all our combinations. Now, one thing that you'll notice here is that we're using a multi-core processor. So it's using all the cores, actually using half the cores of my machine to run a solution. So it's much more efficient as far as the analysis that's being concerned. So it's using different load combinations and different cores to run this really all in series, uh, uh, in parallel rather than in series. So it's a much quicker solution um, than Risa 3D version 17. And so now that I have my results, the first thing I want to do is look at my loads applied. So I can see again my loads applied, but now I don't only have our, uh, our regular area loads applied, I also have our transient loads. And so if I look at our transient loads, you can see just kind of the breakdown of, hey, this area load was broken down into these line loads based on the tributary area and the distribution of those particular loads. We can also look at deflections. So if I click on the deflection button here, just like we looked at before, I can go ahead and pick a different, you know, different combinations. And so we can choose different combinations to see how the structure is deflecting under different combinations here. We can also look at something like member forces. So if I, in the quick view here, come into member forces and choose MZ or something, we can see our member forces along with, in this case, I have my unity check on. So maybe I, you know, I can choose what I want to see or what I don't want to see. And so we can have that information on it. It's much easier to find this information without having to go back into model view, I can turn on a particular result and then I can just select the combination I want to look at. So I just want to look at that combination or I want to look at the envelope, right? And I want to see the worst case for, in this case, I'm looking at Axial, right? I can see that information so that really quickly I can start to, or begin to kind of parse through what's going on in this particular model. Now let's go ahead and turn that off and let's look at our code check. So obviously I could bring my code check, Unity check up here um, for the envelope, or I can open this in a spreadsheet. So if I open my code check spreadsheet here, and then I go ahead and dock that code check spreadsheet, right? I can see graphically in one view and then the spreadsheet in another view, exactly kind of what's going on here. And so I'm going to go ahead and for the hot rolled, I'm going to sort my code check spreadsheet by absolute max. So we can just see all the failing members kind of right at the top there. Uh, so we can see that in this particular case, all the members that are failing are their tapered wide flange beam members. Um, now, with these tapered wide flange beam members, one thing that we haven't evaluated at all yet in this particular case is we haven't looked at anything from an unbraced length perspective. And so if we go ahead and look at um, selecting all those members, so again, I'll select our frame beam is the member that we have here. So I'll select all those members that are failing, tapered wide flange beam we can see in our design properties that we haven't had any we haven't select we haven't set anything up so really it's looking at an unbraced length as the full length of those members when in reality that's not necessarily the case for these particular members and so i can go ahead and choose you know how i want to apply the unbraced length for these so maybe in this case you know based on the spacing of the purlins we have an l comp top that is you know they're 5 foot spacing so we can put a 5 foot spacing there Obviously, we're going to lose results because we're changing the way that things are, uh, are connected. So I've got that five foot spacing. And then maybe because, you know, maybe we have some additional bridging in uh, the model. Maybe we haven't modeled that, but we know we're going to have some additional bridging because they're details that metal building guys give you. And so I'm going to put maybe L comp bottom to be 10 feet, right? And so we can see that and maybe uh, we can look at that um, as, our, uh, as our, our model. So now I can go ahead and resolve this. So create a batch solution real quick again just kind of plow through the analysis results again, and then go back to looking at the code check to see if those members um, are now passing, to see if those uh, more accurate unbraced length considerations have done us any good. And so if I go ahead and look at the code check now, you know, maybe we're still getting some, some failures, but we can start to, you know, really kind of go through this a little bit more um, to see, you know, what's going to cause um, those members. So maybe, maybe we need, you know, a deeper member, or maybe we need a, a, a thinner, you know, maybe we need to change the section in some way, shape or form. And so we can go ahead and see that. The next thing is, is let's go ahead and look at our cold form steel members. So again, uh, we do have some failures in our cold form steel members. We can go ahead and I'll look at the code check and again, sort that code check max to min to see that a lot of our purlins in this case are failing. And so again, let's go ahead and select maybe all of our girts at the same time, uh, or excuse me, all of our purlins at the same time to kind of see, you know, what it is that we have here. So 
let's select our GERTs. Actually, let's just clear the selection first because we had our um, we had everything selected and we didn't really want everything selected. So I'm going to go ahead and select our purlins here. Okay, so with our purlins selected, we can do the same exact thing. We can come into our design considerations and say, okay, well, you know, for our purlins, you know, maybe we're we're sheathed by the metal deck, so comp top, you know, maybe is zero feet, and um, because we're you know completely sheathed by the metal deck. And the LBYY, maybe we're going to put some, adding some, some struts, some, some secondary bracing at the mid-span of the purlins. So maybe seven and a half feet. So we're going to add those kind of in the mid-span of all those locations, right? And then maybe for the girts, which we haven't uh, selected in this case, you know, we can go and select those girts. You know, the same sort of thing here is that we're, even though this is looking like an open structure now, obviously we're, we're sheathed. We've got kind of a wall panel or metal uh, panel around the outside of the building, we can go ahead and add in uh, some sheathing in that case to be um, uh, zero here in that particular case. And so now we can go ahead and rerun the analysis to see, again, how these unbraced length considerations that we hadn't paid any attention to until we got to kind of our analysis, how that's going to impact the overall design of these members. Now, obviously, we could get to a certain point where we need to change the member size, but obviously it's super important to first make sure your unbraced length considerations are set the way that you want them to and the way that they're expected to so that you can start to make some changes here. So we reduce pretty significantly the code check here. So, um, you know, maybe we need to go ahead and add a little bit more information. Maybe we need to, you know, look at this piece of information and see why this is failing. So maybe uh, we can go ahead and look at our detailed report. And if you haven't seen the detail reports, that's another really great feature of the new version of Risa 3D is the detail report is exhaustive with information. So we can see all the diagrams and, and, and other stuff that we saw before, but we can really get into our flexural analysis um, in the strong axis to see step-by-step -step kind of what's going on for this particular member, why it's failing, you know, what's going on in local buckling, yielding, different things. And then ultimately all the way into kind of our interaction to see the total uh, bending check for this particular member. Obviously, we're not going to dig into this uh, step by step, but we could go through all of that different information. So there's really no guesswork as to why something may be passing or failing in this particular case. Now, um, if we go ahead back to you know uh, the hot rolled steel members, you know maybe I'm going to open up uh, a detail report of one of these tapered wide flange columns, and so we can see the detailed report of this particular column. Again, all of this information. Now, if I wanted to take this information, it's great to look at it here, but if I wanted to add this information into our detail report, we could go ahead and just say, hey, click here to add to full report. So I'm going to go ahead and add that into the report when I build a report. So I've got that added here. Let's go ahead and X out and close out of my um, code checks. And I'm going to go ahead into the print report inf interface and say print report. And so the interface changes now and we get this kind of print preview interactive kind of report template creation so that we can build our report. And so now we can start to put in different things based on what we want. So maybe if I come into my advanced section, I've got some images here, right? I've got my ISO view, right? That's the first thing. Maybe I want that first on my model. You know, I can come in and add some different spreadsheets. So let's add, you know, I can add in materials. So let's look at elements. You know, maybe I want hot rolled and cold form material spreadsheets. So if I look at the second page here, I've got those spreadsheets. You know, maybe I want to add in loads. So we can come down to loads here and say, you know, member area loads, we can add those all in. So we've got those loads in. Maybe we want combinations. So we can put the combination spreadsheet in. You know, we've got all this stuff that we're beginning to add. We can also look at results, right? So down here in results, maybe I want to add in um, our enveloped node reactions. So we can put in our node reaction spreadsheet. Again, we can look at the, dy the dynamic nature of our print preview. I can also look at something like elements. So let's look at uh, our members code check. So this is an envelope code check for hot rolled members, right? Now, this is a pretty big list, right? And so if you don't want to look at everything, you want to see maybe we were just looking at our columns, I can actually use what's called a filter. So I can edit this filter. So I can change this filter and say, I actually want this particular spreadsheet to only show me results for our column. And so if I click filter there, now we can see that I'm only getting results for our column. So I'm, I've got the, you know, let's see how many columns are there. The 14 tapered wide flange columns that uh, I have in this model are what's showing up there. So you can really kind of dial into exactly what it is that you want to look at in this particular uh, model. Then we can go ahead and look at detailed reports as well. So if we look at detailed reports, we're looking at our member detailed reports. 
Um, we can say, I want just the envelope report. So I don't want every load combination. I just want the worst case. We could pick one of these, um, you know, tapered wide flange. So maybe I'll pick like M26. So let's just come in here and, you know, find, um, let's see, um, let's just add M25 just because it's right here. And so now we can see that spread, that uh, report added right into our detailed report. And so that detail report then includes all the information. Now, when we added that, we added that as a report that's just not expanded. So it just has this basic information. So, you know, we're just looking at the basic information for this particular member. But if we wanted to, we could actually go ahead and change to say, I want the expanded code check, right? And so we would get, if we added now, a, a, you know, an expanded one, now it would have every limit state expanded showing each and every piece of information um, that we have in this particular limit state. So you can include maybe a really detailed one along with some uh, not so detailed ones. And then finally, when you're ready, you could either, maybe this is something that you're doing over and over again, you can save this as a template. So this is your metal building uh, report file that you're going to save as a template. You could bring in other images from, you know, if you had drawings, maybe we wanted to include the DXF drawing as an image here, you could bring that in as an external miscellaneous item just by clicking add image. And then finally, you can create a PDF. And so we could create a, a Bluebeam PDF where we can, and Bluebeam being a sister company of ours, we can go ahead and just create that PDF so that you can view um, the report and that information um, right here in our, uh, or right from our model so that you can share that with your code reviewer or, or your colleagues or, or whatever. And so at this point, um, we've been going for just about an hour. So I'm going to just um, jump back in. I know Deb has been answering uh, a ton of questions um, during uh, this time. And so uh, we'll keep the questions open here, um, but we want to be respectful. And so um, we're going to go ahead and um, can, can you answer the questions? Uh, so if you have more questions, go ahead and put them in there. But um, at this point, this is um, the end of our webinar. And so we really thank you for uh, joining us for this dive into metal building design in RESA 3D. Uh, if you have additional questions beyond just asking questions in the questions database, I encourage you to uh, please reach out to our support team. We've got three engineers um, on support all day, every day from 6 a.m. Pacific to 5 p.m. Pacific. And so you can email support at resa.com or just give us a call at our main number and ask for support. And there, there's always someone there to talk to. The other option is that if you're maybe new to RESA or um, maybe you're new to Risa 3D version 18 and you hadn't seen this new interface or haven't really got to play with the new interface yet. If you're interested in learning more about that or sitting with myself or one of my other colleagues for uh, a live demo, um, we're happy to do a live software tour and just kind of answer your questions and show you the ropes. Um, so you can go to our website and there's a bunch of different places on there in the learn section or on the homepage to request a software tour. And that just comes to one of our engineers and we can set that up through a Zoom meeting. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, we hope you have a great day.